Hello and welcome to the Spike Podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and back with me this week, as ever, we have Spike's editor, Tom Slater. Hello. How are you doing? Ella, how are you? Not bad. Ella Whelan, Spike columnist, of course. On today's show, we're going to be focusing on the Salman Rushdie attack and what it means for free speech. So as the whole world will know by now, this shocking news happened uh, last week. Salman Rushdie, the author of The Satanic Verses, was stabbed multiple times in New York last week. Tom, um, first of all, what did you make of the attack, you know, and the shock of it? Oh, no, it was incredibly shocking and stomach turning, really. Mm. You did just think the scumbags have finally got him after all this time. And I think a lot of us were, almost were acting as if, if not actually thinking this, that it was kind of all over. You know, he was only yeah. in hiding for 10 years after the fact while was declared. He's been living a relatively normal life. He showed up at this particular event pretty much without security. And that's how things have been going for a long time now. But you know, the threat was always there. The price mm. was still on his head. And it seems like, although we're still waiting to hear more details, that this 24-year-old from New Jersey, in, you know, decided to finally act on it. And I think it's, if this doesn't wake us up to the threat posed by, by Islamist intolerance, but also just the new intolerances in general, nothing mm. really will. I mean, the, the symbolic insignificance of someone finally even getting close to him shouldn't be um, understated. And I think all of those people who even now, you know, I'm sure we'll go back and talk about 1989 and the staring at the shoelaces that was done then and the caveated defences of Rushdie and all the rest of it. But the fact that even now you've got people who are struggling to find the minerals to mm. condemn this with no ifs and no buts and no caveats, I think tells us that we're still really in a very deep hole when it comes to freedom of speech and our ability to stand up to it in the face of this particular threat, but all threats as well, definitely. Let's um, stick with this particular threat, the the Islamist threat. I mean, you know, often the Rushdie affair is seen as kind of the first example of, you know, the kind of Islamist crackdown on free speech, the fatwa by the Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini. But there have been so many other attacks since then. Um, I mean, there are attacks in the wake of the fatwa, even though Salman Rushdie has been unharmed until last week. I mean, Ella, what have you made of that? Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of almost a little known fact that lots of people who have worked on the satanic verses over the years have been themselves subject to attack, translators, mm. um, people who have been, you know, uh, talking about the book at events have been all over the world. Publishers as well. Attack. Yeah, so that, and, you know, I think it's really important that because I've seen some people in the wake of this attack talking about the fact that this is just a kind of Iran thing and that it's mm. just to do with Iran which completely negates the fact that the guy was, as Tom says, he's US born, he's Lebanese or something. Mm. He's, he's, you know, the guy who is... He seems quite fond of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and whatnot. And there's allegations yeah. he had contact with them as well, but, but I do understand but, what but, but it's But it's the kind of thing that's, you know, this this is something that doesn't just happen in a specific, you know, it's not just specific to one country and one person. Yeah. Yeah. It is something that is influencing people around the world. I yeah. mean, we've seen it in our own country of course, there have been recent incidents, uh, you know, in France in relation to the massacre of Charlie Hebdo staff, or indeed, even more recently, the beheading of the teacher Samuel Paty. Uh, both incidents, which involved the people who died, being you know being told that it was basically their fault because they had depicted the Prophet Muhammad in yeah. various ways, or even just in the case of Samuel Paty, dared to show it in a picture in a class to talk to discuss with his students. And so, you know, 34 years since the Satanic Verses come out, came out, and there is still this kind of sense of, uh, you know, as Tom says, a cowardice around coming out and saying not only that there, this is a specific problem to do with religious extremism, yeah. Islamist terror, but also to say that this isn't just an isolated thing. This is a thing that has exponentially grown mm. and grown yeah. pretty much because of our inability to point a finger at it and call it out. Yeah, I mean, you think, you know, in addition to Charlie Hebdo, and in addition to Samuel Paty, there were the, you know, the, the Dutch filmmaker, Theo van Gogh. There's the Danish cartoons incident yep. in 2005. These things keep happening. You know, Islamists keep targeting people who are alleged to have blasphemed against Islam and against mm -hmm. the Prophet Muhammad. And it's a perfect demonstration, as you were just saying there, of how the way in which the West has responded to this is demonstrating a remarkable lack of cow a remarkable cowardice, but at the same time has obviously inflamed this particular yeah. issue. It's by giving in to this intolerance by trying or trying to tiptoe around it, you've you've essentially given a green light mm. for more and more people to act in this way, to have um to take their offense and 
kill and maim and harm people over it. And, you know, we've really got to condemn this. It's not only is it medieval, frankly, it's also just utterly pathetic. I mean, the combination of those two things, I think, was really striking in the Russian case. You've got a 24-year-old man killing someone three times his age yeah. because some long dead cleric told him that he should be offended by a book he's probably never read. Mm. This is utterly condemnable, ridiculous, disgusting. And yet there's still this nervousness. I mean, it, it's been fascinating going back to looking at some of the responses at the time, yeah. which I think a lot of people have forgotten. There's certain ones people remember, you know, Jimmy Carter writing in the New York Times in the months after the fact while that um, the Satanic Verses was an insult mm. to Muslims, you know, making the point you shouldn't be attacked and whatever. Throat clearing, throat yeah. clearing, but still making that point. Um, but even things like the, the Thatcher government said yeah. at the time, obviously they offered Rushdie um, police protection and all the rest of it. But Margaret Thatcher herself says something about how, you know, Christians not understand how hurtful it is or something to this effect when your religious sensibilities are mocked. Um, Jeffrey Howe, then the foreign secretary going on BBC World Service and effectively saying, yes, this is a this is a deeply this has deeply offended people and we understand that. I think it was actually Iran that first properly cut diplomatic ties. We pulled out all of our people from Tehran, but still mm. tried to maintain this weird kind of half measures thing. Just really, really fascinating. And then you look at the response now, Keir Starmer taking a full day, it seems yeah. like, to respond to this. Um, you know, the, one of the first news stories that came out in that kind of gap when we were waiting for more information was Sky News saying, why is Salman Rushdie so controversial? It just gives you a measure of where we're at. I think the probably if there's only if there's any improvement, I think there's probably been more silence yeah. this time around rather than those throat clearing statements. People know at least well enough not to say that. But whether they're doing it because they're scared of these reprisals is obviously stupid because it's been made so much worse by ignoring this particular issue. But I think the the honest truth is a bit more disturbing, which is they actually share in some of these sensitivities now. Mm. They've almost co opted them. They brought them on board, and all the other examples that you talk about and the lack of response to them in each case demonstrates that they think that, that the Ayatollah is right in some way, yeah, shape or form, whether they want to admit it or not. That you shouldn't insult Islam, that it is offensive to Muslims, that it is potentially even hate speech. I mean, there have been cases in Europe where, you know, the European Court of Right, Human Rights has effectively held that, you know, anti-Islamic blasphemy uh, can be, can constitute hate speech, this kind of modern blasphemy mm. law. And we saw it in the, you know, there was thankfully no um, attacks or bloodshed but there were certainly threats being made quite explicitly relating to the prospect of um, terrorist attacks or something like that when The Lady of Heaven came out mm. in UK cinemas. And you had this, you know, it only happened very recently and there was kind of little discussion about it in terms of little defence of the idea that a film that allegedly depicted the prophet, it wasn't even in a bad light, it was just that they dared to kind of do something with the lights and the shadows that showed the prophet Muhammad. And it was some kind of like sectarian dispute within the film, but the basic allegation was from these extremists was that it was blasphemous. Mm. Um, and you had, was it Cineworld's chain of um, cinemas send its staff out to go out with a megaphone to say to these, you know, protesters or basically gaggle of sort of nut jobs, which yeah. is what they were, and say, we completely understand, mm. we're on your side, we think we think the film's terrible ourselves, you know, and even though <laughs> we're being made to show we it. don't <laughs> share your religious views or anything, so we, we'll cut it, we're, we're going to pull it, no yeah. worries at all. And, you know, it might, it might seem crass to compare the pulling of a film with the stabbing of Salman Rushdie, and I don't think I'm really sort of drawing comparison or equivalence between the two, but the same narrative is behind it, which is this idea that, you know, blasphemy mm. um, and the idea of talking about a religion, criticizing a religion, sending up a religion even, um, particularly in an artistic form, whether it's in the novel or in a film, is, is you know, so abhorrent, so in the same as kind of equal to violence yeah. that it can then be met with violence. That and it's worth saying that outside Cineworld, there were people saying things like, we were born to defend our religion, we will do anything to do, you know, very yeah. loaded language, that, really kind of extremist stuff. That threat of violence is always hanging there in the ether, even when it's not explicitly articulated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the threat. That's why people mm. give in. That's why yeah. people capitulate or they're worried at least about trouble and at worst about something much worse than that. I'm, I'm glad we got into blasphemy though, because that's one of the things that I think is so striking about all of this. Which is that obviously we often talk about how um, you know we might have got rid of our blasphemy laws, but we've, we've kind of created all these new blasphemy laws around yeah. hate speech and all that stuff, and all that is very, very true. What I find fascinating is that in this particular case, more or less informally, um, but in some cases more formally, we have created like a kind of Islamic blasphemy law. 
um, in practice, if not, you mm. know, actually inked in law. And the strangeness of that shouldn't really escape us. And also the fact that if this is a uh, arrangement that we're going to be comfortable with, we have to recognise that that is the end of freedom of speech. Yeah. I mean, the f- struggle for freedom of speech essentially begins with the struggle to be able for religious freedom and to, and to be able to blaspheme, essentially. That's what it's built on. Mm. So if we get rid of that, we're completely screwed. And I think the Lady of Heaven example is, is important as well um, because of the fact that when we talk about the right to offend and right to blaspheme, you know, you might kind of think of someone who just wants to just outright say mock and criticise religion, which of course people should be entirely free to do. It's almost become a duty in this particular moment that we find ourselves in. But at the same time, it's also freedom of religion. Yeah. Because there are different sects, even within Islam, who are considered to one another to be heretical, blasphemous, apostasy, yeah. all this kind of stuff. And the Lady of Heaven, in a small way, is an example of that. You know, that these largely Sunni Muslim protesters were taking offence at a Shia-made film, mm. effectively told from a more Shia perspective. And so what you had with Cineworld and various politicians getting involved or not getting involved was a kind of sectarian conflict. So when you give in to these the most loudest, extreme, threatening violence type voices in this discussion, you're also giving in to just one particular hardline, mm. and in some cases sectarian perspective, and dressing that up as being nice to Muslims. You know, it's, it's just fascinating how time and again you've essentially got polite society, and in many cases many people in politics, have just bought the line that's been pushed to them by the most extreme Islamist voices in the room yeah. and decided that's the Muslim community. But that is where we're at right now. That's the that's the underlying racism of this, if we're going to talk about that in this discussion. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, the assumption that, you know, these Muslims are so mad that yeah. they see something blasphemous and they're going to, you know, chop someone's head off. I mean, it's obviously, it takes a special kind of lunatic to, to do that. The background to all of this is that, the, you know, the reason why you have... Um, you know, atheist liberals running to the defence of, as Tom says, some kind of sectarian row um, within a particular religion is, you know, because there is this suggestion that something needed to be done in capital letters about Islamophobia Mm. and that Islamophobia was a huge problem and therefore you needed, you know, you have to kind of do anything, you censor any kind of discussion about Islam, even about Islamism and, you know, Islamist extremism um, in case... But, you know, if you, <laughs> it's a kind of awkward comparison, but if you look at relig- the to- intolerance towards religion in this country, it seems to me, it strikes me not to kind of um, kind of play sort of oppression Olympics or anything like that. But we know that the, one of the b- biggest threats against religious groups is, you know, synagogues around the country have to have bodyguards. If mm-hmm. you go up to Stamford Hill, there's, there's kind of like huge men blocking every kind of kids building and things like that. There is a, there's a problem with anti-Semitism in this country. And yet there's not a similar kind of discussion there. Now that's a kind of a whole nother can of worms to open and talk about. But there is, but it just strikes me that if the kind of MO behind this sort of censorious approach to discussion about these things is because we're so terrified of Islamophobia, Mm. well, that doesn't seem to be getting any better if it was a big problem. And it also seems to be a kind of misdirection, more importantly, of, of the kind of efforts for societal change because... The one thing that's going to embolden this kind of te- you know, terrorist behaviour, um, and you know we've seen it in relation to the threats that happened, you know the Manchester Arena bombing and things like that have happened in this country, is that so many of the people who are accused and then charged of these heinous crimes talk about Islamophobia, so it mm. becomes weaponised, and it's just what a mess. Would you leave your keys in your car even for just a moment? Imagine you're at a petrol station and you're just going inside to get a snack. You could probably get away with it most of the time, but before long, you'd come back out to see someone driving off with your car. Well, that's what using the internet is like without the protection of ExpressVPN. You see, every time you connect to an unencrypted network, in a cafe, a hotel, an airport, on a train, your online data is really not safe. In fact, any hacker on the same network can gain access to and steal your passwords and financial details. And it's not all that hard for hackers to get away with it. All they need is some cheap hardware. Even a 12-year-old could do it. And that data is pretty valuable. Hackers can make thousands selling your information on the dark web. But ExpressVPN ensures that can't happen. ExpressVPN keeps your private data safe. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so your online activity can't be seen by anyone. 
It'd take a hacker with a supercomputer more than a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. And it's actually all very easy to use. You just fire up the app and click one button to get protected. Plus, it works on all devices, phones, laptops, tablets, TVs, and more. So you can stay secure wherever you are and whatever you're using. What could be easier? On top of all those incredible security features, ExpressVPN lets me access some amazing content from other countries that would otherwise be blocked. For instance, I can access the content on any country's version of Netflix, and that means getting access to tons of films and TV shows that aren't normally available. So secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash spiked. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S vpn.com slash spiked and you can get an extra three months for free that's expressvpn.com slash spiked tom i mean there have been a lot of people obviously in the wake of this mm. talking about you know supporting free speech the need to put to support free speech or artistic expression i mean is it too cynical to think that this is going to go the way of charlie hebdo where you know, for a moment, we were all just we Charlie. And then within a matter of months, you have, you know, various groups saying, well, actually, they insulted Islam. And, mm -hmm. you know, no, exactly. I think we're already there. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Mick Hugh makes his point on Brendan's podcast this week, where he talks about that, you know, there hasn't even been a Je suis yeah. Salma moment. There wasn't even that kind of original visceral burst of support. Uh, there wasn't even, you know, the, it's actually fading away quite quickly. Mm. And that's, remarkable you know and i think that's the thing which we've been talking about a lot in relation to just kind of is it's you know acts of islamist terror in recent years as well people get over it very quickly yeah. in a way that i really do not understand and when it comes down to freedom of speech as well it's just um you know you can't get away from the fact that people have internalized these ideas to mm. a certain extent they've internalized the idea that it's essentially racist to give offense and also they don't recognize that these ideas like islamophobia was a term popularized by islamists yeah to try and protect their ideas from criticism and to deflect criticism even of themselves. Mm. And they've been remarkably effective at how just idiot liberal metropolitan elites have bought that completely. I mean, if you, you know, we, they're all Ayatollahs now. If you think yeah. about the response to Lady of Heaven, if you think about the response to Batley Grammar, if you think about the various things that have been um, pulled or silenced or censored in recent years, they completely bought themselves. If you think about Pen America's response to the Charlie Hebdo being given that award, that posthumous award, where you had hundreds of you know prominent writers coming out and saying that we can't support this because this is a racist, Islamophobic magazine. That's that's why you see the silence. It's not yeah. just because they're nervous and you know they don't know what to say. Although I'm sure that's true for a lot of them. It's also that they have imbibed those kinds of prejudices. If anything, the two have fed off of each other yeah. over the years, particularly something like Islamism, which is, is is a creature of identity politics in so many different ways. And maybe part of the reason the science is maybe they do see a bit themselves in some of the intolerance that we're seeing meted out now. That's kind of what I wanted to move on to, like the broader kind of climate of intolerance, because it really isn't just Islamists who are trying to shut down uh, debate. And, you know, in within practically hours of um, Salman Rushdie's attack, you know, J.K. Rowling, was um, given a death threat that some people were quite dismissive of, you know, someone saying you're next, essentially, um, because of her views on on trans issues. I mean, Brendan O'Neill put it this way earlier this week, that we've got to stand up to the trans fatwa as well. Mm. I think that's exactly right. And I think one thing we've got to get past is this quite dismissive response that you've seen where people say that when you try and talk about the broader issue of cancel culture, mm. censorship, um, the conflation of speech with violence, which you see across the board, certainly with the trans issue, to you know, to criticise that ideology is to erase trans people. Yeah, in their words, it's like every gender critical article is a mini holocaust, according to mm. this, genuinely. So this is this is the sort of thing. Um, you, there's this dismissiveness. Oh, you want to bring J.K. Rowling into this? Oh, you want to bring the culture war into this? You want to jump on this, you know, horrendous tragedy as a means to start um, just pushing the points you were pushing beforehand? Um, on the one hand, I find it really quite grim that you have people saying well you know jk Rowling, she only got a death threat this week it's not the same <laughs> as being stabbed on stage is it you think is that really the road that we're going to go down mm. with this but also you have to recognize that these things are connected that you stand up for free speech for all or for, or for none at all you can't break it up into bite-sized chunks and just because you know the people um in the kind of woke set fundamentally you know that they're not going to 
at least show no intention of, you know, taking up arms anytime yeah. soon. If we're talking about the ability to speak freely, then it's clearly been curtailed. And that's why, you know, Salman Rushdie signed that Harper's letter yeah. condemning cancel culture. This is why he's been speaking so passionately over the course of the recent decades about the issue of, of freedom of speech. And he himself said, there's been a lot of Salman Rushdie quotes doing the rounds at the moment. He said that as soon as someone says, I believe in free speech, but you stop listening. Yeah. And I think that's a, probably quite a good approach to take <laughs> going forward. But of course they're connected. And I mm. find it interesting, obviously people saying the satanic verses never get published today, which is absolutely true. Um, Hanif Qureshi has even said no one would even write it, today, yeah. which I think is, yeah. a, is also a good point. But we are in a situation where Harry Potter probably wouldn't get published mm. today, not because of its content, but because of the views of its author. Yeah. And we saw that with the gender critical authors who supported J.K. Rowling, people like Gillian Phillip losing their job just for throwing up a hashtag or whatever. So of course these things are connected. And if anything, they feed off mm. of one another. Um, and anyone trying to just dismiss that is trying to dismiss the whole discussion. That's why they're doing it. And Ella, on, you know, on top of all that, on top of the kind of broader censorious culture, in Britain at least, we still have state censorship, you know, enforced by the police on your tweets, on, you know, what stickers you can put up on, not outside your house and things like that. I have to say I was, I sort of, it's, it's not that I smirked because how can you smirk after something like this? But when um, Boris Johnson kind of made the British government statement about, um, about support for Salman Rushdie, which was welcome and, you know, condemning, um, you know, <laughs> the view that was coming out of Iran saying the only person to blame is Rushdie and his supporters, which is kind of appalling crap you'd expect from Iran. Um, Boris Johnson said something like, of course we, you know, it, this is absolutely untrue. We support Sam and Rushdie and we support free speech in this country. And you think, no, you don't. Mm. No, you don't. What, you know, show me one piece of legislation of, of the last 10 years that hasn't been infected top to bottom with a censorious approach and a fear of free speech. Um, you know, whether it's the online safety bill, whether it's the police crime courts and commissioning bill, all these different kind of layers upon layers of legislation that's been brought in um, in the last few years to curtail or to control or to uh, make, in some cases, make illegal you know, the idea of offence, the very thing that's at the heart of the satanic versus controversy. Yeah. That as something that is offensive to somebody else should be banned or should be silenced is, you know, goes right to the heart of everything that the Conservatives and the Labour Party believe in. None of them have even, I'm not even talking about the kind of radical view of free speech that we might have. Yeah. But even a kind of, even a sort of common sense view of mm. freedom of speech. And this is Boris Johnson, who is supposedly, you know, the man who talks about letterboxes and, you know, doesn't mind what he says and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, and the reason that's important is not to just sort of, you know, split hairs and say, oh, well, you know, and be miserly about it. But, you know, if you, it's very hard to send out a kind of clear message in support and not, Tom's right, not just in sympathy with, but in solidarity yeah. with Salman Rushdie. If you yourself are, in a, are, you know, head of a country, and this is just Boris Johnson's all politicians, but if you live in a country in which the kind of thing that happened to Salman Rushdie could happen here, yeah. because we don't share that kind of uh, belief in free speech. I mean, America is meant to be the home of the free. It's meant mm. to be the land of the free. It's it's liberty. It's everything. And uh, on a stage in in one of its states, someone gets stabbed for what they wrote 34 years ago. And that has become, as Tom says, almost kind of normalized, that yeah. kind of behavior. So you've got to, you know, social change doesn't come from legislation, but you've got to, as a nation, have a fundamental belief in free speech to give a message to the kind of people like this attack or, or all these kind of terrorists across the world that their views are not tolerated mm. and that they don't have any support. And I was just thinking when you were saying that, also the core thing that links all this together, we've already touched on it though, is that speech is violence thing. And if we're talking mm. about the point of connection between an Islamist and a wokeist, it's that they fundamentally share that particular viewpoint. And that is why it's so important that you take all of this up across the board. All of this is quite interconnected insofar as we've conceded the principle within Western societies, this isn't yeah. a kind of foreign importation, uh, that words wound um, and that, again, that could be different for particular people. You could be blaspheming against a religion or you could be blaspheming against the new religions that we have, whether it's gender ideology or anything else. Um, similarly trying to kind of push mumbo jumbo as actually, you know, eternal truth. That's therefore that sanctions almost any kind of response when yeah. you frame it like that. I mean, it certainly sanctions someone having to lose their job, mm. but surely if speech is violence, then violence is a legitimate response to speech. People are going to pick up on all of that. And I think the fact that this was a attack from a homegrown Western citizen, yeah. US born, 
and the fact that so many atta- you know Islamist attacks we've seen in recent years and all the rest of it um, can often be um, British brought up Muslims themselves. It tells you that this is this is fundamentally a Western problem in mm. many respects. This is the signal that we're sending to people of all different backgrounds in society. And some of them are getting picked up by a kind of Muslim identity politics, which has really bloomed in the worst possible way uh, over the course of the past few decades. But there's others who are attaching themselves to other ones. They might not be violent in many cases, but they're all deeply insidious and they all feed each other, actually. And that's why you've got to confront all of them. You're watching The Spikes Podcast. While you're here, you should subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell so you never miss a video. But even better, to keep up with all of Spike's content, all of our brilliant articles and essays that we publish every weekday, you should sign up to our newsletter today on Spiked. Every weekday, you'll get a roundup of all of Spike's content, plus some exclusive commentary. To sign up, just go to spiked-online.com forward slash newsletters and click today on Spiked. That's spiked-online.com forward slash newsletters and today on Spiked. Now back to the Spiked podcast. So one area that you think really relies on free expression and pushing the boundaries is comedy, but even comedy is kind of falling under the spell of cancel culture. You know, the offensive, the famously offensive comedian Jerry Sadowitz um, had his show pulled from the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, We learned this kind of last week. So, some, I mean, they've, they've finally come for mm. Sadowitz. What's going on here? That, that's what's so strange about it, because I always thought like Jerry Sadowitz was like as woke and as a liberal liberal and as, you know, ref- just soaked in all of the kind of usual prejudices of our age that, as the fringe is. And that's yeah. one of the many of the prominent comedians and all the people involved in it are. Sadowitz was always like the exception that yeah. people would make because his material is, um, his onstage persona is every kind of ism and phobia you can think of. It's, it's racism, it's mm. sexism, it's misogyny, general depravity. Getting out his penis. Getting out his penis was one of the things <laughs> that downed him in this situation. But there was always this kind of understanding. First of all, because people recognise he was brilliant. It's, yeah. it's hilarious. And it's part, and you are laughing in spite of yourself. Mm. Um, but there was this sense of like, that's different. That's art. Yeah. We can... So even though every so often there'd be a kind of controversy around, there's a bit too many rape jokes at the fringe this year, or this particular show has upset some people. Um, there was all, he was always like kind of held up as the exception. So for um, the Pleasants, one of the big four venues at the fringe to turn around in the face of complaints, seemingly in in large part from people who work there, are often kind of students who get yeah. jobs for the summer working at the fringe or whatever, um, that they've cancelled him. It's really, really remarkable. And you see that in a lot of the response from even people who you wouldn't expect to come out on the side of free speech. But it's just inevitable, isn't mm. it? How could Jerry Sadowitz and that, like his survive in an era when we're told that context doesn't really matter? Yeah. That if people are laugh, people can't laugh at anything with a glint of irony, if they're laughing at a, a particularly grim joke, it's because they just share in the prejudices being portrayed on stage. We have kind of arrived at a point where particularly with things like comedy and things of that kind of art forms of that nature, people genuinely f- really struggle to make the distinction between a performance and actually like saying it just, you know, in real life. Mm. So I suppose it was inevitable, but that doesn't make it any less nuts that yeah. this is what's happened in this case. <laughs> Ella, is it just people being so literal minded that they cannot see that, you know, someone saying something racist for laughs is not the same as actually being racist and spreading racial hatred or whatever. I think it is. And I think it's a, it's a kind of willful unwillingness to engage in an art form, mm. which is, you know, comedy is different to theatre. It's different to singing songs. But there is a degree to which you kind of leave reality at the door yeah, and you enter yeah. the, you know, the dark room of the comedy, comedy club. It's, you know, they've set up that way for a reason. And you enter into a different world. Someone on Twitter um, shared an anecdote about a Sadowitz performance that they'd seen 10, 15 years ago. And it's just, it's really interesting to, to, I'm just going to briefly tell you it, because the whole point was that Sadowitz was talking about this inability to differentiate between Jerry, the man who you see walking his dog or whatever on Saturday, and Jerry on stage. And he was sort of saying to the audience, I know it's hard for you to understand that I'm doing a performance. Don't worry, I've got a table full of hats back here. And I'm going to put the hat on so that when I put the hat on, you know that I'm not being me, I'm being someone else. And he went to the back of the stage and his silence, because everyone's thinking, Jesus Christ, what's he going to do? And he comes back with an SS officer's cap on and says, (laughs) and his hands on his hips, says, okay, what are we going to do about these Jews then? 
which is horrendous. And he's, it's he's Jewish himself. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. you know <laughs> the whole place erupts with laughter because actually what he's what he's doing there is saying something quite profound about the the skill of what yeah. you do when you're a comedian. We forget this. So much of comedy and the timing of jokes and everything is in a shock factor. Mm. And Sadowitz's entire material, as Tom says, is about shock, is about, yeah. I cannot believe he's just said this. You would never, ever hear this said before. And actually, it's kind of a cathartic experience. Mm. People think that when people laugh at a sexist joke, for example, that they leave the theatre and, and are going to be horrible to women. That's not what happens. That would be a complete misunderstanding of what's going on in that dark room. It's that you kind of... It, it's it's almost like telling the emperor he's got no clothes. It's like calling yeah. out all this stuff. It's a kind of way in which you exercise things, and you don't. And it, it means bogeymen don't get created because what happens when you don't talk about these things and you have this sort of Id ridiculous idea of the public that if they hear anything derogatory or anything with an ism, they're going to repeat it. Then we know in wider politics that stuff festers, and actually that's mm. when things go underground. But you know, so in a way, you can say. I don't know how he'd feel about this. The Sadowitz is doing a kind of public service in his act in that, you know, okay. Sure. And if you don't don't want to go out and see him get his dick out on stage, which is what he does, yeah. then you might want to heed the 18 plus warning that the Pleasance Theatre yeah. put on they the were, show. They were very well warned. There was an 18 plus <laughs> yeah. warning. The name of the show was not for anyone. Yeah. Mm. There was a previous shows where he was called, you know, comedian, magician, psychopath and all this yeah. sort of stuff. Equal Opportunities Offender was another one. Like all of the, it's very well signposted. That mm. if you walk and there's in loads there. of nudity at the fringe. There are loads of women That's who do like you know, yeah, vagina yeah. mugs for Christ's sake. You know, like what is this kind of prudishness? People should have realised what they were getting in for. <laughs> um, and I, t I take your point there about you know being a kind of vent and all the rest of it. But I think there's also an element with this band, also you know, or this um, clamp down, but also others, I'm sure, where there's an element of like people feeling like. That the political imperative has to come before anything else. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that's um that's very distinct about Sadowitz is that he's you know, he never really breaks character. Mm. He's never like it's never it's never kind of like I'm doing this to make a positive point. Yeah. It's just letting vent to this mm. venom. Like it's that and it's kind of that's the point in it, and expressing it in a remarkably funny, punchy, almost poetic way. Mm. There's no other reason for it other than that. It's just to sort of be a piece of art, essentially. Yeah. But we do live in a time where everything has to be subject to like this broader political imperative. Yeah. You either have to, you know, serve the interests of social justice, how, how they would define it, um, or not talk about anything, or just talk about, you know, in-flight meals or something. Yeah. That's loads of the two options that you have. And the fact that there's no space for him is a really bad sign. I mean, it does just show that you do just kill comedy if you mm. embrace these kinds of ideas. And that feels like it's a hackneyed phrase at this point. But when someone who, certainly even amongst the kind of fringe establishment, everyone knows is like a real great. Yeah. The fact that even he's been caught up in this, I think, yeah. demonstrates that point is that not only if you take on this kind of intolerance and this work censorship, but if you basically believe that art has to be put to work, it has to do something, it has to push in the right direction, um, then it's deadening and yeah. it kills the art form. And this is a one neat example of that, I guess. Although I have to say, I would listen to him talk about in-flight meals as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spikes' other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spikes-online.com.